So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background and then go into how I got into using architecture as a um, focus of my work, one of my focuses, and then go over some projects that I'm doing. Um, so I guess it was maybe 90, 88, 88, I was uh, going to, uh, started going to a junior college in California for photography, for fine art photography. And I was interested in experimenting um, using negatives that were torn or cut up and taped together, scratching negatives, painting on the negatives or the photographs using different processes. Um, eventually I went to finish up my schooling at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. And I started doing collage. Um, this collage is called Paris. I used old um, magazines from, life magazines from the 1940s and other uh, materials. And then I would photograph them and present them as photographs. But actually the, the collages are really special and I kept them and I think they're much better than the photographs now. Um, so um, the next image shows um, 1881 Chestnut Street, which was a pinnacle piece and inspired me to make a three-dimensional sculpture. This collage is an old apartment building with the front wall missing. And so when I saw what I did with all of these like three-dimensional rooms in a two-dimensional setting, I decided to make a three-dimensional sculpture. And I made a uh, three-dimensional house out of gator board, which is a hard cardboard and covered it inside and out with collage. I also had lights. And from there, I made nine other pieces that experimented with different processes. Most of them had collage using um, found material, old photos, my photos, um, handmade wallpaper. I used motors and pulleys sometimes to move things, um, fans to make wind, um, sound, lights. And then I got to a point where the work really changed and um, it was a motel in 2002. Um, this piece, I was always fascinated by motels because well, growing up in California and when I was young, we would travel. Um, we would travel in a like a trailer or a caravan to, and camp, but we also stayed in some motels, which are kind of um, magical places. They have stories that um, are quick moving. So people stay one night, a few nights. There's all sorts of dramas in each room. And I like to think about what happened there. Um, they, they're really, I don't know, special, especially to the US because here in Europe, there's a lot of hotels, but it's quite different. It's not the same. Um, also in, in the US, especially the Southwest, um, Route 66 is such a famous place and so much of it's disappearing. So I also at a point wanted to kind of capture this um, disappearing place. So this piece, the most of the collage disappeared. It was inspired by Psycho in a way. There was a hole in the wall, hidden um, clues all over the place. And there were two bathrooms, two rooms and two bathrooms. And I had a pump room. So if you pushed a button, the water would run in the shower and in the toilet, which was, you know, but just like, <laughs> which was really um, fun for me. I. I was always experimenting and trying new things with the work. And this became my muse. So I had continued doing photography and I took this out. This is in um, Red Rock Canyon, I think it is. And the mountains in the background are actually quite small, but they appear large. I would shoot the sculptures with my four by five camera and then blow them up quite large, the photographs. So. I was <clears throat> reducing the scale of a building and then blowing it up again. Um, so I continued exploring um, motels, uh, places on the edge of town, um, 
architecture, but it was really mundane architecture. And then in 2006, I was asked to do a project with the Selfridges department store in London. The owner's daughter is a huge art collector and she started this um, quite elaborate project there where they have a, a huge installation space and also storefront window for the artist. And um, I did this proposal, it was called Woman on the Run and it's a film noir um, story. Um, oh, thanks. <laughs> it's a film noir story um, that I made up about a husband and wife, um, Victor and Veronica Hayden. And Victor is not such a nice guy. So at one point he goes missing and then Veronica is wanted for questioning and she goes on the run. So within this installation, the viewer can wander and get all sorts of clues and parts of the story, but it's an open-ended narrative. So in the end, the viewer gets to decide, you know, is Veronica an innocent victim or is she a femme fatale? This was um, an homage to film noir, but it was also a feminist piece about um, the roles that women are put in, were put in back then and still today. Um, so my friends and I were the characters. I was the woman on the run and um, and my friends played the other ones. And, and then throughout the installation, you can see different clues. On the TV, I shot a special newscast that talked about it. And if you picked up the old dial phone, you could hear um, some mysterious thing. Um, this showed at Selfridges and then went to Smack Mellon in Brooklyn and about four other museums on the East Coast. So right after that experience, um, I went to Beijing. This was my first time in China. And I was doing a residency with Gallery or Smiley in Beijing. Um, I was there about three and a half months and I was gonna have a solo exhibition at the end. So upon arriving, I left a few days later to travel for a few weeks on my own. I went to um, Chongqing, Shanghai, Yangshua, and a few other places. And this image is from Chongqing. Chongqing is a huge city on the Yangtze River. And this area is called Shibati. It's right in the middle of Chongqing, um, kind of a more like working class area. Um, some of it is almost self-built, um, maybe uh, more impoverished, but right behind it are these skyscrapers. Um, so I ended up building the sculpture Chongqing, which is the next slide. Um, I'm gonna show you, I actually have these sculptures here. They, so they showed in Beijing and then um, they came and showed at my gallery in Brussels and now they're with me. But it's much more interesting, I think, to see it in person. Um, this is Chongqing. So this is actually water and this is Shabadi. And it's made up of um, images that I took while wandering around and video. And then these are the skyscrapers. Um, this is Yangshua, which is in the south. Oops. <laughs> and over here is a communist saying that I found while I was riding my bicycle out in the countryside. And it says something like, um, oh, have less babies and plant more trees or something. Um, and this is Chao Changdi, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, this is where the gallery was actually. So there's, um, 798, which is an art space, a huge art space in Beijing. And then 10 minutes further is Chao Changdi. And the gallery was right here, all out here. So this is kind of looking down. Oh, I'll unplug it. <laughs> so loud. So, um, so I built Chongqing and then I went back like the third time I was back in um, China, I went back to Chongqing, it was in 2018. And 
that area Shabadi had disappeared. Um, I guess after researching, I found out that it was torn down, I think in 2017. And there's a movie, a documentary called Last Days of Shabadi um, made by a French um, filmmaker that explores the neighborhood right when it's being ready to be torn down. Um, so when I went back, it's just like nothing. And now I guess they built like this fake historical little part for tourists and then, you know, they're developing the rest. Um, so inadvertently I had kind of captured something that disappeared, um, which is something I do now purposely. So this image, this is from Chao Changdi. Um, I would wander around the village in the day, at night, all the time, it was right there. And um, I would look, you know, of course I'm kind of a voyeur, so I'm looking in all the windows that don't have covers on them. And I saw like the, the building on the left, I saw a place like this, but there were, um, there was a bunk bed with two young men in it, you know, sitting and hanging out and that's where they lived. And I found this really interesting. So I decided to build a life-size house, just like I almost took it from the village and, you know, transported it a few blocks into the gallery space. And that's Wong's house, which is the next slide. <laughs> so yeah, you can see in the background, the telephone pole, which is actually right back here. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so this was like a really, um, interesting, exciting trip. And I really loved to travel, document my experiences, and then to recreate what I saw. And to me, nothing's important to be exact or, um, you know, measure to scale. It's more about my impression of the place and the people, you know, it's not just the buildings. What's really interesting to me um, throughout my work and my travels is um, how do people live? How do they live? You know, is it like me? Is it different? What do we have in common? Um, what's their daily life? And yeah, that really gets me excited. So in 2015, I was doing, I guess I was doing this meditation practice where um, I was meditating, but I was also doing a meditation visualization experiment. Um, and this image came into my mind. It was a little different from this slide. This is called 1000 Shacks. And um, the image that came to, into my mind was like wider and shorter, um, but it was, it's about global poverty. So I decided to build it. Um, it took maybe eight months and I wanted to shine a light on this issue because it's a, an immense issue that isn't going away. And I think often people want to ignore it. So even though it looks like a favela because it's built one on top of the other, I used images and video from uh, around the world. And <clears throat> it's almost about the whole, you know, humanity, but, also addresses housing precarity or lack of adequate housing, um, lack of safe water, um, you know, food, different, different, um, different subjects within the large subject. And I built it so it was tall and would overwhelm the viewer. Um, when you stand beneath it in real life, it's um, loud, there's sounds coming from all the videos, and it's chaotic, and it's something you can't ignore. And it, um, <clears throat> it stands with scaffolding in the back. So after that, I built another piece that kind of had a similar idea in that I was it, getting into this, like, um, building upon building idea. And this is called Tenement Rising. Um, you can see on the left, there's a projection and that was called Tenement. And that's a smaller sculpture installation that I made in 2005. So this is kind of like taking that and blowing it up. Um, this is more about overcrowding um, large cities and packing people in. 
but it's also about how um, you can be alone and even lonely when you're surrounded by so many people. And if you're in a large city, there's a sense of anonymity. <clears throat> um, the next image shows the place that it was inspired by. So this is Kowloon. It's in Hong Kong, it's a walled city. Um, if you saw a bird's eye view of it, you can barely see any streets. The buildings are built right next to each other. Um, it's a fascinating place. And by the time I saw images of it, it was already torn down. So I wanted to make the sculpture similar. I made the buildings darker so they would look like this and um, went for a similar kind of view and feeling. Um, the next image is a close-up of the installation. So it looks like there's video. It's not video in all the windows. I have a uh, light behind the installation, or several lights, and there's um, images printed on white film. So it shines through and then video in some of the windows. I left the back open also because I like, um, I like that it's, it's also, you know, a constructed object and you can walk around and see that it's fake. It's not trying to be real. And the back almost looks a little precarious and delicate and like it could fall down. Um, the way that I build in a way is that you know, I'm not trained as a woodworker or as a, you know, architectural model builder. I just am pretty much self-trained with building things and I work really fast. Like I, my work's so detailed that I just have to work as fast as possible so I can finish what I want to finish. And, um, and so it actually ends up looking really interesting and more like art on the back than, uh, than, woodworking or craftsperson. Um, so I ended up showing that piece in a show I did at the Kunstler House Batanien in Berlin. Um, oh, you can change it to the next one. In 2015, I visited Berlin. I was living in Oakland and I had a project in um, Frankfurt at the Historical Museum. And I just fell in love with Berlin. So I decided to move there in 2016 to try it out for seven months. And then in 2017, I came back and I did a residency at ZKU and then a 10 month residency at the Kunstler Haus Batanien, which this is the place. Um, so for my solo show, I had the tenement, but I also built these life-size rooms uh, living room and bedroom. And it's almost like they could have popped out of the building. I decided to have performances here. My idea behind the performances is that we walk around the world pretending, not everyone, but in general, pretending that we're normal and there's nothing strange about us. But I really feel like everyone's a bit of a freak. So the idea behind this is that when you're in your own space and you have um, privacy, you do a lot of boring, mundane things, but then there's some really strange things that I think everyone does and they're all different things. So this is really interesting to me. And um, this is what I showed in the performances. I had, I think maybe 10 performances during the opening show. And then I had a performance in the middle um, instead of an art talk, I wanted to do something maybe different. So I had whiskey walkthrough and performance. I read a statement in the bedroom and then I got a tattoo on my forearm. And um, my friend's um, thrash metal band, Hertzanks, played in the living room. And um, two men wrestled in the bedroom in their underwear. You can show the next image. You do. So yeah, these are men wrestling. And I just made a backstory for this that you didn't really know when you watched it, but the men would walk in the room clothed and then they undressed to their underwear and they oiled themselves up and then put on the, um, the wrestling 
helmets and then would wrestle on the bed and then take a break and watch TV and drink something and then wrestle some more. And my idea behind this was that um, maybe these men needed some physical interaction with another man, but they this is how they would do it. Meet once a month and this would happen. And and I can imagine that this could be something that happened somewhere. Um, but visually, it was really interesting also. And um, it was just one of the many stories I came up with for the performances. Um, so the next slide shows, this is Kotbusser. Let me find the actual name of the place. Yeah, this, this building is called Zentrum Kreuzberg. And when I first came to Berlin, I came across this right at twilight and it's really like everything was lit. It was bustling and alive. And it's a, just a crazy place that it's not really captured in the image, uh, but it's maybe a little dangerous. There's a lot of drug dealing going on at night, but it's not just that it's um, you know, there's a lot of different families living there, all different cultures. Um, it's just very lively, kind of exciting cool place. I, I like it a lot. So I decided to build it. And um, the next image shows the sculpture. Um, so this was built as a social housing in the 70s. And then I think it was late 80s, they were going to tear it down. And then it was owned by private, private owners, but the government would like I think pay them to have a social housing, but the prices kept going up. So eventually a group organized called Cuddy and Company and they helped to get the government to buy it. And so now it's saved and um, you know, still affordable for the people that lived there many years. Um, after that, I maybe about two years, three years after I built another apartment building that's right across the street. You could go to the next one, Rafaela. This is, um, I think it might have been built by the same architects. Um, anyways, this has changed quite a bit. It used to be white and yellow, and now it's just kind of ugly colors, but I think the building's really beautiful. So with both of these, I'm initially so attracted to the building and this kind of weird... I don't know, 60s, 70s kind of sci-fi utopia look. Um, and then this has this um, graffiti from um, famous graffiti group here in Berlin. So this also was saved by Cotting and Company and um, now, you know, can remain, you know, somewhat affordable social housing. Um, the next one is the Mauser Bunker. So with, with both of these um, apartments, I also built a donor kebab shop that's down the street. And, um, oh, and this, well, I'll show you. This is, uh, this is where I did my Muay Thai kickboxing class. I guess it was in 2020, I think, that they started a petition to save the Mausen Bunker. And this building was, um, it was a research place where they did animal experiments on mice and rats. Oh, wait, let me turn this off. So, oops. <laughs> so Charité Hospital that owned it, they built another building and moved out because it had asbestos and then they were gonna tear it down and there was a petition to save it. So I saw the image and then I, I went there and visited, you can't go inside, but I visited the outside and decided to build it. So this is the actual sculpture. It's not exact. There's, it's, if I were building it exact, it would be longer and um, there would be another, I think two levels maybe, but there's videos, um, video from some movies when I was young that dealt with like these killer rats and um, also some um, animal dissection and 
various things I found. Um, so I built this and then they were having an exhibition in Berlin at, uh, I forget the name, it's an architect gallery and um, Ludwig Kainbach had curated a show um, around the mouse bunker to try to save it. That show traveled to Venice during the Architectural Biennale in 2021 and my um, mouse bunker was able to go there, which was really nice. Um, so now it's, the petition helped, it was saved and then Charité Hospital just came out with their plan of what they're doing and they're leaving it alone and it will possibly turn into something else eventually, but who knows what it becomes. Um, but for me, it's interesting to, to capture it in case it's gone, I guess. I feel like I kind of save it. Um, the next image is my installation in Venice. Um, in 2018, I returned to China for the third time. In the middle, I was back there in Zhujiazhou, which is outside of Shanghai. And um, I stayed at the Swatch Art Peace Hotel in Shanghai. Um, and I documented Shanghai and Chongqing, which I returned to. This is the installation that I ended up doing, which is made up of some of my experiences. The, on the bottom right-hand side, you see um, with the blue windows is a secret bar that was down the street that we would go to. And it's in a nondescript building and you have to know where it is and go and ring this bell and then go in this kind of cool, really small room. Um, because in, in Shanghai, they're really into these secret, secret bars that are hidden. So this was, I guess, another way that I documented what I saw, but combined it with my own experiences. Um, so in 2021, I think it was 2021, I was awarded this Roman J. Witt um, Fellowship Residency at the University of Michigan, but it was postponed to this year, um, January to April. My idea behind this fellowship was to do an exhibition called How to Build a Bulletproof House and our disaster proof house, sorry. Um, the idea behind that is that, you know, with, um, with COVID, with global warming, everything that's going on in the world, it's difficult to find a safe place, but the safe place is really internal. So you have to find this in yourself because that's the only place that really exists to be safe. Um, so I, in the installation, I had, um, everything that I find interesting and kind of a safe place or a fantasy place almost with murals, with rainbows and waterfalls and tropical islands. Um, I also had some different kinds of housing in the installation and I did this piece. Um, it was a mobile home called We Buy Homes for Cash. So in the U.S., there's a lot of mobile home parks, um, which, you know, they're affordable places to live, but there are a lot, a lot of issues with these. In the video, I show some video from FEMA, which was like federal emergency, um, some federal emergency foundation that helped during Hurricane Katrina, but they provided trailers for um, the survivors from that that lost their homes, but the trailers ended up having formaldehyde in them, so they were toxic. So eventually they tried to round up all the trailers and put them on a lot for, I don't know, maybe five years, but then they started quietly selling them off. So people still live in these trailers. Um, also at a lot of the trailer parks or mobile home parks, um, the, the trailers are falling apart and people like are kicked out a lot. It's just, um, you know, it's kind of not an ideal housing situation. So this piece covers that. Um, also, while I was at the residency, one of the main parts of it was to do a public project and to work with students. So I worked with over 250 students, um, refugees from Afghanistan and Kenya, and also some clients of a housing um, or you know, a homeless center. 
um, we were creating a room of one's own. So we had wooden boxes and gathered all these materials and would have workshops where we sat around together and made these rooms. It was really a wonderful experience to just sit and talk and connect with so many different people. And especially the students after um, being online for so long, they were just really craving to have uh, interaction, human interaction with each other. So this was really nice. Um, we showed it next to the exhibition in a, a room where they could be on display during the show and then took some of them and created this kind of, you know, building in itself on an old railroad cart that we pushed around the campus and then took over to the Ann Arbor um, Film Festival where it stayed for the duration. And then all of them went to the Ann Arbor Art Center for um, display in the storefront. So I really enjoyed this to um, kind of share this experience, but also give all these people a chance to, you know, take part in an exhibition and, um, and have their ideas seen. Um, then when I came back, I was back three weeks in Berlin and then I went to Tokyo which was another project that was um, postponed. It was supposed to happen in 2020 and then 2021, and it ended up in May of 2022. Um, while I was there, I was researching love hotels and Japan started love hotels many years ago. A love hotel is a place where you could rent a room for a few hours, sometimes even an hour, um, also often six hours, and then there's like an overnight option. And it's predominantly to have sex, but other times, you know, a group of young women might rent it and have a party. So there's different variations. It doesn't have to be to have sex, but couples, you know, used to, and sometimes still rent it because they might be living with the parents, or if you were in a more traditional Japanese house, there's screens separating the rooms and there's not a lot, lot of privacy. Um, it's also, you know, also for host or hostesses and prostitutes go also. Um, I saw a book of these um, themed rooms. So some are have crazy themes and I was fascinated. So I started working on this project and then I visited a few. This is Hotel Rochelle SM, which is a bondage uh, themed um, hotel in Tokyo. And then I built a sculpture of it. Um, that's the next photo. Yeah, I built this and then photographed it on the balcony at the residency with Tokyo in the background. So when I went to the rooms, I was bringing um, different people with me to do interviews about love and relationships. And I gathered a bunch of masks and wigs and gave them a chance to choose which one they wanted to wear. And it gave a sense of anonymity so you could feel more free to say what you wanted. I also let everyone who participated choose a name so their name doesn't have to be you know, associated if they don't want. The next image is, um, that's in the um, Hotel Rochelle SM. So there's, that's me on the left. And then on the right is a friend's brother and he's um, Killer, that's his name. Um, so that's a sex chair I'm sitting on. <laughs> and they had like over on the right at the top, you can see there's little uh, rings hanging and it's almost like, uh, like the subway trains because that's a big fetish. Um, yeah, so this is gonna be a video that I make. And the next image is in Shinjuku. I was wandering around and saw all these images of young men um, looking like K-pop singers or something. And I was really fascinated. They're everywhere and there are big trucks driving with huge LED panels that have these men on them. And they're all kind of numbered one, two, three, four. It ends up they're male hosts. So in Japan, as well as many parts of Asia, there's uh, hostess clubs. 
where women drink with men and entertain them. And it's not sex, although it can be sex occasionally outside of the club, but it's more just entertaining and flirting and the drinks are really expensive. And so there's these male clubs and women can go and drink and pay a lot of money to be treated like, you know, this guy is your boyfriend or he's listening to you. I think also it could be sometimes thought of as an exchange of power where a lot of uh, female night workers go there for the majority and possibly they need someone to listen to them or they need to feel like they're in control. So to me, this all was so fascinating, the different uh, power shifts and how is it different from the female host clubs? Um, you can show the next image. This is Club Opus. I ended up building, this is my sculpture and I photographed it um, with Tokyo in the background, but the residency, Tokyo Arts and Space, they are really amazing. And they had um, organized that I could visit two of the male host clubs and do interviews. So this is one of them and I'll build the other club. Um, so this is uh, a show coming up at House Umlitza Platz, which will be next November. And right now I have it titled How We Live. It will look at um, different ways of living, I also plan to go to um, Napoli. There's a place outside called Scampia, Bella di Scampia, which is kind of a, a failure of social housing. Um, recently, just, I guess the last two of the three remaining um, giant apartment buildings were torn down, but when it was built, it was built really cheaply and it ended up being taken over by the mafia and drugs. and Lots of poverty, not a lot of um, infrastructure for people there. Um, so now they're trying to revitalize it, but I want to um, go capture this amazing building before it changes too much. And the final um, slide is another show I'm really excited about. This is gonna be in spring or summer of 2024. Um, it's a collaborative two person show with um, Roger Ballin, who's a really amazing photographer and artist who lives in Johannesburg. Um, we'll have this at um, Popo Gallery in Munich. They're opening a big new space at Bergson Kunst Craftwerk. And, um, and we will mix our work together, but we'll also make a collaborative piece. So that is it. <laughs> Thank you for, um, for coming and listening. And thank you, Rafaela. And now I guess if anyone has any questions,